everyone. Thank you for joining with Winning in Mind podcast. I'm here with Troy this morning. This this morning, yeah, this morning. And we are interviewing Kevin Mather. And so I want to give you a little bit of, I don't know, Cliff's Notes version of all of his accomplishments. He was in 2012, he was a silver medalist at the Ironman World Championships, which I think is super cool. And then in 2017, he made the championship team for the World Para Alpine Skiing Championships. And then archery, I guess he got into archery and then started dominating archery. And he's heading to the Paralympic Games. He holds five world records currently. He is he was Para Man of the Year for World Archery. Yeah, I think we just need to talk to him. So... Let's get started. Well, good morning, Kevin. Good morning, guys. How y'all doing? We're doing great. You're about to do awesome here in a couple weeks. That's certainly the plan. So I'm getting really pumped, excited. You know, um, it's it's all becoming real. It's like we're leaving. I think a week from today, I take off from uh, San Diego. So it's uh, you know packing my bags, making sure everything's in place, and all that. So it's you know the uh, the pre-competition, uh, whatever mentality is really starting to sink in now. So, a lot of people probably don't know who you are. We've known you for several years, right? Probably more than most people that we know in archery. You've probably been around for a while. For those people that don't know you or your history, can you kind of give us a rundown of your history, how you got in archery, and leading up to the Olympics? I've been an athlete most of my life. I was actually like in high school, I played football and then I stopped playing football and I kept eating like I was playing football and I ballooned up to like almost 300 pounds. And, you know, so my late teens, early twenties, I got into, um, kind of running and I started with like half marathons and then stepped my way up to marathons, you know, and along the way I'd lost a bunch of weight. Um, and I, I ramped, I kind of like gone down to like three or four mile runs, you know, every other day or something like that. And then there was a marathon I wanted to run and I was like, Hey, I'm going to run this. And it was like, I don't know, maybe two months away. I just thought no problem. And so I ramped my training up too quickly and got plantar fasciitis in my feet. You know, your feet are always painful and sore and all that. And I was like, I need to keep doing an enduring, you know, a, calorie burning exercise but my feet hurt so I bought a bike and started riding and then since I did I could run pretty good I could bike really well I was like I might as well learn how to swim and be a triathlete so that's what I started training for um and I was training for an Ironman that was in Northern California in 2009 and I was out on a bike ride with a bunch of buddies and a truck hit me from behind doing about 60 miles an hour and you know that kind of shattered my spine uh around the belly button area and you know um crushed my spinal cord so i became paraplegic you know july 3rd of 2009 and um you know was in the hospital from july until mid-september and you know, rehabs, did outpatient rehab for the rest of that year and got back to life. And, um, yeah, then I, then I, you know, a, a couple of years later, I started training for Ironman as a para-athlete and, you know, because one of my friends challenged me, one of my friends who was on the ride with me that day. And, um, so I started training for that and, you know, 2012 Ironman world champs in October, uh, I had qualified and then competed and got, you know, silver at that. And, um, yeah, that was, that was probably one of the things I've worked hardest for in my life. And, uh, going to these games is probably up there on that list as well. Um, just the amount of dedication and commitment and, uh, waking up earlier than you want to be and all that fun stuff. So, um, you know, I've, I've done other things along the road. Uh, you know, somehow I got into ski racing and I lived in Aspen for four seasons skiing up there and training with the team. And, 
you know, I out ski most of my able-bodied friends at this point. Um, and, you know, went to world champs for alpine skiing in 2017, but I also went to archery world champs in 2017 because it was in the summer. So, um, I thought that was kind of cool to go to world champs in two different sports, um, the same year. And we got a silver medal in the team round at that world championships. So my, my first international event was world championships, which is the biggest event outside the Paralympics. And I walked away with a silver medal. So, um, that kind of hooked me. I was addicted to the sport and, uh, that allowed me to walk away from ski racing, um, you know, with no regrets, you know, as you guys say, you don't stop working towards a goal, you trade up. And Mm -hmm. to me going to archery is trading up because, you know, I think at best I could have been top 10 on the ski racing, uh, you know, at the para games where archery, I've got really darn good chance of hitting the podium in any event I go to. So, um, so yeah, definitely, definitely happy. You know, life always takes random turns and, you know, twists on you and you don't know where it's going to go sometimes, but as long as you have at least some, some plan and you're okay being flexible and adjusting, uh, you can make it happen. Did you have this kind of optimistic attitude before your accident as well? Is it something that, have you always been so optimistic in, you know, looking at the bright side of life? See, that's interesting because I don't consider myself optimistic now. So, um, <laughs> then maybe I, you were way more optimistic then. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I tend, I call myself a realist, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the glass isn't half empty or full, it's just got the amount of water in it that's in it. So, um, I, you know, I recognize my situation, right? I wasn't happy that I got injured. I wasn't like, oh, this was meant to happen to me. Life's going to be peachy keen. I was like, this sucks a lot and I don't want to do this. Um, But I still want to live life and I still want to do things I want to do. So how do I do that? You know, Um, and, you know, how do I how do I go back to work? You know, I had to learn, there's all these steps, you know, you have to figure out how to get back to life. You know, they, you go through rehab and in rehab, they teach you kind of the basics, but then you go out to the real world and you're like, Oh, this is totally different. Now I've got to learn a whole bunch of different stuff. And I've got to get used to people looking at me because I'm the only dude in a wheelchair within like, you know, whatever within sight at least. Um, so yeah, it's definitely been a learning process, all that for me, but I don't, I never, I just have a never give up attitude, I guess you could say. Like, I don't, again, it's not that I'm happy about, you know, some of the situations that have happened in my life, but I'm like, I'm stubborn. I want to do what I want to do. Like every day of the week, I wake up and I'm going to do what I want to do. And um, so how can I do that? You know, uh, I probably wouldn't be shooting archery. I wouldn't be at the Olympic training center in Chula Vista shooting archery and talking to you guys. If I hadn't got paralyzed. Mm-hmm. Um, do I think that was fate or something? Not really. Do I think it just happened and here we are kind of. So um, I don't know if that helps explain my attitude about life, but yeah, that's, that's how I think about it. It is what it is. So roll with it. Just go. Yeah. With it. Yeah. I, I get yeah might, well, you know, it's like, I I could be just sitting in my room, like watching TV or something like gaining weight, being depressed and, and not enjoying the life that I do have. Like, you know, this happens all throughout different, whether it's your level of ability, whether it's your financial circumstance, whether it's, you know, um, your lack of like opportunity in the job market, like people often look at the things they do not have. And like, if you view life that way all the time, you will more likely be less happy, less successful, and just less joyful of a person. Where if you look at everything you do have, it's like, oh, life's awesome. Like, I mean, you know, for most of the people watching this podcast, it's like, you were born in the US, like, just that alone is a big 
winning like factor like you're probably one of the 90 you know one of the one percent of wealth if you look at the world right in the u.s you might not be doing as awesome but if you look worldwide it's like do you have access to like food every day Mm -hmm. yeah do you have access to clean drinking water yeah you're doing better than a heck of a lot of people in this world so um you know i i tend to look at things like that if that's positive i don't know i just the I guess I'm not looking at the negative things in my life. I'm like, oh, I'm paralyzed. And, you know, my back hurts every day. And, uh, you know, when I travel to other countries, the bathrooms are tiny and I can't fit in them and it's annoying. Like, sure, there's bad things in life too, but there's a lot of good stuff. So I want to get back to, you made a comment a few minutes ago about waking up and doing what you want to do. And right now, one of the things you want to do is bring home a medal, right? Preferably, Absolutely. preferably gold. You have world That's- records. I'm sure you're thinking in the back of your mind, you know, it'd be kind of cool to put an Olympic record on my, on my little sheet there of success. So walk us through, if you will, the planning and what you've been doing leading up to the games. Obviously, you've already gotten through the trials and that kind of stuff. This last year has been kind of crazy with the Olympics. We're supposed to be in a year ago. Now they're here. Walk us through a little bit. How do you personally prepare for this event? And then is there anything that you had to change because we did have to wait another year to get here? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's been a bit of a wild ride. I mean, as much of a wild ride as archery can be, archery is pretty mellow sport, you know, uh, often the precision sports aren't, uh, you know, you go out and you shoot and, you generally shoot how you shoot. You know, if you haven't been training, you haven't been practicing, you're probably not going to shoot as well. And if you've been on it, you're probably going to perform like you've been performing in practice. So I, I purposefully when COVID hit and we were told, you know, as soon as we knew that the games were officially postponed, I I wouldn't say I didn't pick up my bow, but I was really lax with my training schedule because I was like, this year is no longer the important year. And if I had trained at the level I was training at, I would have just exhausted myself and gotten just mentally, you know, overworked and not have wanted to work. I mean, a full extra year at like 90 to hundred percent intensity is going to, that'll drive anybody crazy. And I knew it was, would drive me crazy. So I actually picked up a compound bow and started, you know, messing around with that. Cause I felt, you know, one of the big reasons I did that one, I thought it'd be fun. And then two, um, a compound bow is so much less effort physically, right? You're not holding the full weight at full draw and, it allowed me to slow down my shot cycle with that and really work on my mental process to where I could like really separate everything out and do it as slow as I felt like I wanted to. And so I had to run a mental program and for me shooting a compound bow, it's not, it's supposed to be easier to shoot, but I still shoot better scores with my recurve than I do my compound. So I don't know if that says, (laughs) This, I mean, that's not good, but um, uh, I guess Brady does too, so that's fine for me. Um, that's good company, right? Yeah. If you're, if you're going to be better right. at recurve than you're a compound, you might as well be in the company of a Brady. Absolutely. So I, um, you know, I did that, and I, I cut my arrow count down. You know, I would shoot 150 arrows maybe every other day or something like, you know, in that neighborhood. It, it, it really depended on what my buddies were doing. If I could find somebody to shoot with, you know, go to the range and shoot a few indoor rounds together or, you know, or if there was a new product that I got that I wanted to try out and play with, you know, I really tinkered around that year because I was, you know, to me it was just extra time, but I didn't want to do that extra time. Just, you know, have my fingers throbbing every day from shooting three to 400 arrows a day you know, and 
all that goes along with that, knowing I would have to do it for an extra year now. Cause we got COVID hit right before our trials. And so our trials procedure hadn't even started. So I was like, it's not like I'm in the middle of trials now and I'm kind of in this sort of limbo area. I've had a full year before I had to shoot an arrow that mattered towards the games. So um, I actually shot nationals last year with a recurve and a compound because the schedule allowed it. So um, again, I didn't do so awesome with the compound, but um, it was the recurve national champ. And then um, I didn't do horrible with the compound though. I was pretty happy with, you know, where I wound up considering how much I had been shooting. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's all about, you know, the, the goal setting in, uh, you know, mental management for me is huge. It's, um, if you don't have a goal, what are you working towards? You're like, I'm just slinging arrows for no reason. And, or like, I hope I get good. Well, it's like, you hope you get how good. Um, so, you know, back when I first met you guys and I first got really serious about archery, the, you know, that was huge to me. It's like, you know, an Olympic medal, um, all five of the outdoor world records or sorry, all seven of the outdoor world records held at one time and, um, making an Olympic USAT team. So that would be top eight in the U S on the able-bodied side. Um, so those are my, those are my main goals right now. Um, if I can pick up the indoor world records, I'll, you know, I'll do that as well. But the outdoor ones are really what I'm going after. And yeah, so it's like if, uh, set goals and then, then you can develop a plan. Well, how am I going to hit these goals? Like, how am I performing? Like, how can my process get better so I perform better? Um, you know, when you break it down into logical steps, you know, it's like the, you know, how do you eat a whale? You know, well, you just take one bite, you know, you can't, if you look at the whole thing, you're never going to even start. But if you break off chunks, like, okay, now we can start, you know, going after this. So when you look at your plan, it's obviously changed. When did you make the shift to getting ready for this Olympic run? Now it's, now you realize, okay, they are going to have it in 2021. We know what's going to be. When did you make that shift to where, okay, now I'm going to ramp up my training alter my plan and really get to where I can peak during the trials and the Olympics. Absolutely. So I started, uh, because our first leg of trials was set to be in April, but even that got changed. Uh, so April of 2021. And so in kind of December, uh, you know, November, December of 2020, I started, you know, ramping up the volume and, um, you know, getting closer to that two, 250 arrow per day, you know, five to six days a week. And then, um, then, you know, it ramped into, you know, those 300 arrow days and all that fun stuff. And, um, I mean, I know how to set up a bow to shoot outdoors. I'm pretty, locked in on how I like my bows set up. Um, I, so it's just fine tuning them. Like I get them close. I can get a bow shooting close within like an hour, hour and a half, um, out of, you know, from out of the box. And then it's just the fine tuning, you know, it's shooting groups at, uh, at 70 meters, which is their competition distance and, you know, really making fine, fine tune adjustments on it and just kind of tracking group size and seeing, you know, where the bow really wants to be. So, and that could take, you know, days to a week or something, you know, and, um, and then after that, it's just like, it's all me after that, just, you know, training, shooting, uh, you know, getting, getting the input your body needs and your mind needs to be able to succeed. Like, 
I can't, I could have the best mental game in the business with recurve archery. If I don't shoot my bow, right, I won't physically be capable to get the thing back and op, you know, execute a shot that will hit a 10. Like I physically won't have the ability to like beyond that, if I'm not shooting my bow, my self image knows I haven't been shooting my bow and it knows I doesn't deserve, don't deserve to win. Like, right. I can't like just come off the couch and be like, yeah, I'm going to go win a Paralympic gold medal today. Like my self image is to like, <laughs> no, you're not <laughs> like, um, <laughs> you know it's you can't lie to yourself and so um so where so yeah, is I, that self-image today we got well, when, when do you leave it's definitely in a spot where you know it knows i have a strong chance of winning these games um i you know we've seen on the olympic side that you could be the best in the world and that day doesn't line up for you. And it's, um, you know, there is some of that. And, like, managing managing expectations, you know, that's why it is. When I set these goals, right, you don't just pick one. You don't go to one games and expect to win everything. You know, you, if you give it one shot like that, your chances of success are extremely limited. So, you know, for myself, when I set those goals, it's like, okay, how long do I think I can actively compete in the sport of archery? Like, I'm not the youngest guy in the world, but archery, you can go pretty deep, um, you know, into the age range there. So I felt planning on shooting through the Los Angeles games in 2028 was very reasonable, you know, um, and, you know, it's looking like Brisbane will probably be 2032, and that could be like a maybe, like it's not guaranteed, but if I'm still healthy and shooting well, like I don't see why that wouldn't be an option. Um, so, um, right. So I've got three shots, you know, hopefully of making a team, making an appearance at the games and making a medal. Um, so I am, I'm excited about these games. I'm shooting really well right now. Um, I've shot some of the highest scores I've shot out here at the training center, like just yesterday. Um, you know, I'm training with uh, like Jack Williams just got back from the Olympics. So he's out here. I'm shooting with him. And um, yeah, it's it's been a blast and I'm shooting just really well. So where, you know, it's definitely like more flow state than uh, anything these days. It's like, yeah, I just. Once I decide I'm going to shoot an arrow, I start drawing the bow back, and then eventually the arrow's down there in the tendering. So um, it's, it's nice. kind of like cruise control <laughs> for your mind. That's nice. Tell me how you got started with mental management. How'd you meet Troy? Do you remember? Oh, do I remember? No, I don't remember exactly specifically <laughs> the second I met Troy, but um, – I was working with Mel Nichols as my archery coach mm -hmm. and you know, he was like, you've got to do something for your mental game. And I'm like, okay. Like I hear that. You hear that a lot from coaches, right? You've got to do something with your mental game or we're going to work on your mental game. And the, like the knowledge base there is unfortunately like oftentimes so limited and that's not the case with mel like mel is a mental management coach and he knows the whole thing so i kind of lucked my way into that like and um talking with him he's like well you know i'm a trained mental management coach like you could do the process with me if you want uh, he's like or you could go work with you know troy or lanny and you know, down in Texas and you could do that if you want. And, um, I felt I was going to have Mel be my archery coach. Like he was more my form coach in my mind. So I was like, okay, if you're my form coach, like obviously you use this mental management strategy. So you're going to be using that while you coach anyways. Um, but if I could get 
somebody else who was my mental coach, right? I didn't, for some reason, I thought it would be better to divide the two rather than have it all in one. And I could see different people that work in different ways, but um, it was just like a clear thing to me where it's like, well, if I'm having mental game, like questions and need solutions to like, I'll call Troy. Mm-hmm. If I'm having archery concerns, I'll call Mel. So that's how I went about like deciding to go specifically um, with Troy. And um, yeah, I remember, you know, I came down to Texas. And I remember I stayed at the hotel. It's, it's not like right next door, but it's, I don't know, maybe a mile away. And like I was pushing down the street and it was hot in Texas and mm-hmm sweating like crazy and you know got to the office there and um yeah we just went to work you know we chatted for a little bit but then we went straight to it and you know got to work on you know what are your goals like how do you know how to set goals you know you know all this stuff you know throughout the whole thing and so that was huge for me like some of the stuff a lot of the stuff is very simple it's not like rocket science um and it's so like able to be processed by somebody like myself who's like I wouldn't say I'm dumb, but I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I should work on that. And um I think where a lot of people get stuck is there's all these books out there and there's all these right philosophies and programs or whatever you want to call them for mental game. And the thing I currently run into the most <clears throat> with athletes that struggle, right? You just see an athlete who has great form and their performance is garbage. Or even it, you know, they have amazing form and their performance is mediocre. And you're like, dude, you should be on the top of the podium, like at least one or two events a year. And they don't have a mental strategy because and even if they've read books and stuff like that i have you know one of my friends it's like he's read so many books out there like if you name like a mental strategy or mental um whatever training book he's probably read it Mm -hmm. but that's the extent that he's done like he reads a book oh that was good reads another book it's like nobody puts in the motion what is given to them and i'm like man it's like reading 20 diet books and still being 350 pounds you're like these diet books suck like well yeah reading the book is not doing the work like you know so that's why it was helpful for me coming in i could see what it was like to do the work we could talk about that like what's that look like in your life like okay here's what this says to do well how does that make sense to me how am I going to implement that on a daily plan? Like, you know, going through my performance analysis, like in person with Troy, like that was huge to me. Cause I'm like, if you would have just handed me a performance analysis and gotten me like, yeah, fill this out every day after you train, I'd be like, okay. Like, then you know, cut to Kevin filling out his performance analysis. Today I shot archery. <laughs> it was fun. Okay, thanks. Close. Bye. Um, you know, That's so I got a real. Good... Well, yeah, because I'm like, I don't know what to do in this thing. Like, and, you know, I got a real good model of like how I was going to fill it out. Like, right. Even, the, you know, there's pretty specific way to fill that thing out. But different people are going to have different um you know, strengths, weaknesses, like the language you use, the sort of energy you bring to when you're filling that out. So it's like, yeah, now I fill it out all the time. Then it's my, I've owned it, right? It's become, it's, it's your guys's product. It's your guys's concept, but now it's become part of my training plan. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, like that was huge. Um, like a whole bunch of stuff, like, uh, you know, from little things to big things. Like, I don't know if you want me to give away all the secrets right now. So I'm trying to be, you know, a little cagey on it, but, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll do secrets in a, in a separate segment. 
Oh, perfect. Yeah, we can yeah. we can do that. Hey, Walt. So when when do you head out again? It's in a few days. You you head out or? Uh, I've got about a week. So we leave. I leave Chula Vista the seventeenth of August, and uh, then I go to Chicago for a day, and then we'll be leaving the eighteenth. Um, for Tokyo. When do you compete? And can we watch it on TV? Um, I believe they're going to stream archery. And uh, so it won't be live uh, primetime coverage. Like even. Yeah, nothing, nothing's <laughs> you know, people, live in there. <laughs> people ask me, um, you know, oh, you're going to the Paralympics. Are you going to be on TV? And I'm like, the Olympic archery isn't really on TV, so probably not. <laughs> but you can so, watch it online. After, yeah, you can yeah. find. You know, you can. It's going to be streaming through one of the NBC, you know, um, streaming services. So, you know, I don't know when that'll be, but we we compete on the twenty seventh. We qualify. Um, they might do highlights of that. I didn't even see. So for the Olympics, they didn't do like a full qualifying day coverage because qualifying is not the exciting part of archery. But um, the elimination matches, they streamed every one of those. So um, I'm guessing it'll be similar for the Paralympics. And um, that streaming will probably start the 28th or 29th is what I imagine. Um, I want, cause there's a couple different divisions in the Paralympics for archery. We do have compound in our games where it's not in the Olympic games. I shoot recurve, but, um, but yeah, so there's more matches for us to get through. And you're competing in different. I mean, you've got the individual, right? But you're also Correct. in the mixed event. Is that right? Yeah. I, I plan to be competing in the individual and the mixed teams. So um, mixed teams is uh, one male and one female archer and we go on. So we do have a female recurve archer and, um, but I also have, so my teammate Eric Bennett will be there and whoever qualifies better between him and I will be the man, man on the mixed team. Okay. That so, and that will be determined in the qualifying round. Is that yeah, right? correct. So whoever, you know, it could come down to a point and mm-hmm. it's like, okay, you're going. So we're rooting for Kevin. Want, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> obviously I want to shoot that. I want to shoot everything I can. Um, so. And the know, mix, we'll, would, oh, would the mix be, so they have a the qualifier Would they do the mix, then the individual or do the individual, then correct. the mix or do you know? Yeah, the mixed team will come first, I think. So the mixed team, I believe, will be two days after the qualifying round. Um, and then I don't shoot elimination matches individually until a week after I qualify. Hmm. So that's it's a little interesting schedule for sure. But because of the way they're doing finals, you know, normally we're on a field and they just put everybody – against each other on you know they'll have a hundred targets out and it's like you'll have two archers sharing one target you know so they can have 50 matches going on at the same time well because they want to stream it and they want a good show you know well they wanted a good show for the audience that would have been there uh, like every match is individual so it's like you know, when they do the 30 seconds, so there's 64 archers going into the matches, right? They're doing 32 separate matches, and that can take a long time. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. normally a match is in the, like, 20 to 30-minute range, so times 32, like, that's a long day. So, um, But it does have... make it more exciting. You know, the way they did yeah. it, the way they did the archery... No, I think it's... You know, they come out, they introduce the two archers, mm-hmm. and then you get to see them go head to head. And what's really interesting is as soon as they were done, it's like, get out of here. We got two others coming. So yeah, it was like they kept that ball rolling to where it's like, mm-hmm. holy cow, okay, I got this guy, this guy. So I was watching, well, I was the one of the few that was waking up at 2 a.m. to watch the live stream. And so I go and I'm, I'm trying to watch Brady. And then 
and then of course Patrick Houston's in there, and we know we know him. He's he's fun yep. to watch. And so now I'm like, what well, is he going to be next? He's going to be next. Is, and so now you're waiting, but because they're going through pretty quickly, it actually next thing you know it's four a.m. And yep. I'm like, I've just watched both of these guys compete and a handful of others, and I'm still watching it. So I think I think they've got it down pretty good to where I think the elimination by the time you get there is going to be great. It's going to be fun to yeah, watch. And I mean, they've got it. They've got it put together pretty well, and that's. It's one of the nice things with the Paralympics being after the Olympics is especially for this games with all the COVID mitigation measures and all the contact tracing things you need to fill out and all the processing while you get to the airport. I mean, they were saying for the Olympic games, there was teams waiting in the airport for above 10 hours. So, right, you can imagine, and this is not a huge critique on them, like they had a lot of stuff going on. And so, right, you can imagine it's going to be a 12 and a half hour flight for us from Chicago, right? We land in Tokyo. You've just been on a plane for 12 and a half hours, and then you get to just hang out in an airport, you know, and not, I believe it's, you're kind of quarantined away. So you're not, there's no like, food or anything like that really available and you're just hanging out until they can process you and get your COVID test done and you know all your you know customs and and all that fun stuff and um yeah people over 10 hours and so talking to the archery team they were like I think we were the easiest one like they said they weren't even waiting in the airport for like 45 minutes they're just like yeah we just you know we got off the plane and Kind of next thing we knew, we were doing our COVID test and then uh, we were off to the village. So, so hopefully it's like that for us. Um, But it seems like they've definitely got things figured out more. Like um, they're they're handling the situation phenomenally is all the feedback I'm getting. So um, that part I'm, I'm extremely happy about. And, you know, it's, it's again, one of those things like, I can't control what they're doing with COVID measures, all that, like that, that needs to happen to keep like, you know, Japan's in a different spot than the U S as far as COVID situations go on. So I want them to do whatever they feel is, you know, adequate to keep their country safe and yet be able to make the game still happen. You know, I'm just stoked we'll be able to go there. They could have just canceled this thing and that would have been, just crushing. So, um, yeah, stoked to be going, all that fun stuff. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. I think more people, though, are probably going to tune into the Paralympics this year because of the attention that's gotten. Some of the stuff you mentioned before, we've seen, you know, a year later, people are antsy to see something. And now it's like, okay, what's next? And because we've had to see a lot of the streaming stuff, you know, you're kind of used to it. So now it's just a matter of, okay, well, what's next? Paris next, going to watch that. So I got a question for you. Outside of archery, is there any sport in the Olympics that you love to watch? That you look forward to every Olympic year. You're like, oh, I got to watch this sport. Outside archery. Uh, well, that would go back to my ski racing days. Like, I'm going to watch all the ski races. You know, that goes back, you know, it's the winter games. So... Um, there we go. Yeah. We need skiing and archery, just like the biathlon. Yeah, you would have. They have have the version of, but not as an Olympic sport. Um, they need an it, arch. They need an archery skiing Olympic sport. That's what we need. Yeah, they do. They do have archery biathlon, where it's cross country skiing and archery. But they should they should make it a like a downhill. So you like you're skiing downhill, and then you got to stop and like where it's total archery challenge on skis and you stop and take a couple shots and then like ski down the hill more. Oh, yeah. That'd, that'd be, be awesome. Cool. There we go. We're coming up with a new event. That would be cool. And then Kevin's perfect. in it. Then then you get to Pete every other year. Oh, that'd be perfect. I like it. I like where this is going. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> we'll call the, we'll, we'll, we'll name it after, after you. Perfect. The Kevin Mather rooster event. <laughs> um, I'm not the rooster anymore, though. It's, I know. 
Most people it don't know be, that. You used to have the rooster hair. It could be a big old mohawk if I did it now, but that would require <laughs> a lot of work, and a my hair is very heavy. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, watching uh, some of the past video, that was that's like your trademark for the long, longest time. Yeah, it's funny. So the coach I was working with when I made the world champs team, you know, my hair was, it wasn't this long, but it was kind of longer. And he was like, you should probably do something that kind of stands out. He's like, you've got a big personality and you're probably going to get interviewed and yada, yada. And I was like, all right. And so I was like, what could I do to stand out? I'm like, I'll just do a big old mohawk. And you know, this is my first event with the team. And so none of the, all the teammates had met me at trials, but I mean, it was a two day trials event for the team. And so we didn't get to hang out really. And so on the team, like I show up now I got this Mohawk and they get my kind of like my personality and, you know, whether you call it confident or cocky, it's one of the two. And uh, they're like, you know, one of my teammates is like, especially with my Mohawks, like, yeah, you are. You're like a cocky little rooster. <laughs> <laughs> so I got called rooster and, you know, nothing to do nickname. with the red hair, right? That had nothing no, to do with it. Not either. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, so I've been I've been rooster on uh, on the archery team since you know just about day one. So um, so yeah, I like it. I roll with it. It's there we good. go. Kevin's gonna legally change his name and put rooster as his middle name. We'll That'd see. be good. Like then I can have it on. I'm gonna change it to my last name. That way I can have it on the back of my jersey legally for world archery events. Oh my goodness, that'd be fun. <laughs> Then, like the like the football player Ochocinco. Ochocinco, yeah, I like Rooster better though. <laughs> yeah, me too. I like too. Rooster better. That that flows much nicer. So, what what else do you have for Kevin before we we end? Oh, just one more thing I want to know. Um, give us give us one little thing that you feel like was the biggest. You said the performance analysis was a takeaway, and you don't have to go into all the secrets. But I want one other mental management. I don't know strategy or something that is most important or valuable to you that you learned from Troy when you came? If you can think of something that's, it could be a principle or it could be whatever comes to mind. Yeah. I'm trying to think like one little, cause it, it, normally it's like at least a three step process, right? Like how, so I guess that process, it's not a, that's, that's a big thing, but like how you break down your day, right? Like mm -hmm. preloading and end, and then shooting an end, right? So an end in archery is when I shoot my six arrows. We shoot six arrows at a time, and then we go down, score, come back, and do it again, right? Rinse and repeat. So how I approach that and actually thinking about, so right, preloading, how I think I'm going to be successful and focusing on how I'm going to do that before that end even starts, right? Preloading that and then shooting it. That's the actual action. And then reloading it, like, how did I perform that end? How did my process go that end, right? What can I do this next end to improve my process, to give my chance, you know, give myself more of a chance of success this next end? And, you know, that was big to me because archery, if you can, you can't focus on like 12 different things at one time when you're trying to shoot an arrow. But if there's one thing that you can you know, sort of point to that you can make better, right? Everything else is sort of just happening. Like, right. I don't think about like, Oh, make my fingers do this and make my arm do this. And then the arrow goes that way. Like that just kind of happens. Mm -hmm. um, but if my bow arm is like weak and like dropping or something like that, like, well, I can like give a little more attention to that bow arm driving at the target. Um, you know, or if my anchor feels weak, I'm like, and my anchor felt like it was all over my face, you know, because we anchor with our hand on our jaw. Um, my anchor, like, I don't know if I was finding consistency with my anchor. So, you know, this next end, every time it's going to feel right or I'm going to let down and start over. Like, you know, it's just stuff like that. Again, it's giving yourself a plan to find more success. And again, so, right, like before it could be, 
like I'd shoot and they'd kind of be all over the place, not all over the place, but like bigger groups than I wanted. And you're just like, well, I just got to try harder next end. And then, you know, you get into that try harder and then you get into like, well, now I'm trying 110% to shoot a sport that requires a hundred percent. And then it just goes almost off a cliff. It's like, this is not going to go well for the rest of the day. So, so yeah, that, that mindset of, you know, the preload, the action, and then the reload, um, was huge for me. Awesome. Awesome stuff, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to have Kevin back for sure. I think so. Yeah. We, we have you back. We're going to dive into a little more of your, your past because you've got some interesting stuff when you were younger, before you got into archery, that would be a lot of fun to talk about too. Now you've intrigued me. Yeah, because he's a, you're a competitor by nature. I think extremely competitive I, in a variety of things. It's interesting. I love competing. I love competing at the things I choose to. Um, there's a couple things I do that are competitive that I'm horrible at, but I still do it because I just enjoy doing it. Like I'm the last year or so I've been playing chess and I suck at chess, like <laughs> really bad, but I still, I probably play three or four games a day, you know, online and I get smoked by like seven year old kids, I think. And that's fine. I still just have fun playing chess. So it's, it's interesting the things I choose to be. Cause right. If I was super competitive about it, I'd be like, screw this, walk away. Um, but uh, well, if you need yeah. your self image and chess built up, just play Heather and I. I'm sure we'll oh. help build your self image. Yeah, I don't Perfect. even. I don't even know. I don't even know how to play, so That's you can certainly smoke point. me. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, then I'll certainly play. Um, but yeah, I even brought. A, I got my chess board that's coming with me to Tokyo, so I can get beat by my teammates at chess. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about everything, but yeah, we can chat about everything I've done. So have you watched Queens Gambit? Oh, absolutely. And that's what got you hooked, huh? It certainly helped. I was playing a little bit, but then like watching that, I was like more stoked and that's where I thought I could be good. But I haven't started taking drugs and staring at my ceiling yet, so uh, I don't think I'm going to go down that road. But <laughs> seems like that was the key for her. Yeah, oh a little goodness. twist in the story, but it was it was I thought that was it was pretty <laughs> fascinating. Binge oh, watched that through the whole way uh, through. It was it was really yeah, it was good. Great. Show. Well, we want to wish yeah. you the not just wish you the best of luck, but we're going to know that you're going to do amazing things at the Paralympic Games here really soon. And we're going to trust that you can shoot subconsciously, have the confidence to do so, and know what to focus on. And you have access to your mental coach, and apparently he's available at 2 a.m. So, you know. Yeah, better be. <laughs> Especially in that time zone, right? <laughs> yeah. That's right. You can do it. So if you, if you want to watch Kevin, make sure you go to NBCOlympics.com to check out when the events are. They do a really good organize, – they organize that quite well. And it'll give you what the schedule is going to be. And make sure you follow Kevin. And I'm sure we're going to see him do great things here in the next couple of weeks. So thank you for being with us this morning, Kevin. I know, speaking of early, it's I know it's like probably 7 a.m. for you when we started this. So thanks for, for coming on. We want to wish you the best and can't wait to hear it when you get back. And I'll let Heather close us out. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Remember to like this video and then subscribe to our channel so that you can learn more later.